everyone. It's Paula Ferris, and welcome to my new podcast. We're getting really creative here, and we're calling it the Paula Ferris Podcast. In all seriousness, I'm so excited that you're here. I promise we will not be wasting your time. Each week, you'll be connected to stories. You'll hear aspects from people's lives that are either untold or undertold. You'll have clear takeaways, equipping and encouraging you, inspiring and empowering for each season that you are in. I guess that's just the journalist in me making sure that this is tangible, that it's relatable for you, and that you feel like someone is championing you. Speaking of seasons, it's a new one for me. Some of you may know me from my time at Good Morning America or at The View. Well, I've officially left ABC News just a few months ago, in fact. I'm in a season where I'm branching out. I am trying new things, and I am refusing to believe that I have to be one thing for the rest of my life. During this pandemic, my family and I took a huge leap of faith, and we moved from the hustle and bustle of New York City to a small town in South Carolina. As you and I get to know one another better, I'll tell you all about it. But for now, I will say this. Sometimes change is chosen, and sometimes it's chosen for us. Now, this wasn't necessarily change that we chose. It's been uncomfortable at times, but it's absolutely been the right path for us, even though the initial nudge was admittedly a little painful. And that gets me to today's episode, which is our very first. How do we know when it's time to leave? Whether it's a job, a relationship, maybe it's a move across the country, or perhaps it's time to off-ramp and try something new. I know a lot of you are dealing with this very thing at this very moment. And we're digging into this topic with Candace Cameron Bure. That's when I just knew I, I can't do this because it's actually going to tear me apart as mm-hmm. a the human being that I am. And it's not worth it. You may know her from Full House or Fuller House as DJ Tanner, maybe the Hallmark Channel. Personally, I know Candace from my time at The View. We both worked there at the same time. And we both admit it was the toughest professional experience of our lives. We both left for different reasons. In this episode, I'm excited for you to find yourself in Candace's story. You're gonna hear from her struggles when she off-ramped early in her career, not feeling like she was using her gifts, feeling like she was called to do more than, as she put it, cook, clean, and change diapers. You'll also hear about the flack that she gets for getting married young and a really honest answer about why she left The View. Here's Candace. <laughs> How are you? I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. Are we going to have therapy right now? We are. This is my therapy voice. I hope you have some tissues nearby. I do. Okay. I do. I'm mm. prepared. And I have my cup of tea. You and Val have been married 24 years, right? Yes. Is that is my math good? Yeah. I can testify to the fact that you're super close with your family. So... You had your kids when you were pretty young. You got married when you were 20, and then you had Natasha when you were 22. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Yes. And then shortly thereafter, you had Lev and then Max. Do you think one of the reasons you're so incredibly close to your kids is because you are you had them at a younger age, or do you think it's just your parenting style? I think it's a combo of both, mm-hmm. for sure. Although I feel like if I had kids later in life, I would be equally as close to them. But there may be a difference in the way we communicate because when you are a lot older and have more maturity and wisdom (laughs) in your life, Mm -hmm. it seems to be like your, you know, your kids find you unrelatable because you're just so old. Like me. Whereas I did have what? Like me. That's pretty (laughs) much how my kids feel about me. I'm old and unrelatable. Paula, no. No, it's true. So I think being a mom, a young mom, does help me relate to my kids somewhat better, Mm -hmm. although I am still an old fogey. You're not old. (laughs) You're younger than I am, and you still look like you you could pass for a 20-something. You guys, it's not fair. I worked, Candace and I worked together at The View, and that's really how we got to know one another. You could pass mid-20s, and it's just not fair. It really isn't. I thank you. Not if you get up super close, but oh, so, no, I, I have it. been up in your business and you could still pass for 20 something. Thank you. You take good care of yourself, though. I and, do. I try. And you also just have an incredible gene pool. So. Yes. My parents are lovely. They're amazing human beings, mm-hmm. but they do look young for their age and 
take care of themselves too. Yeah. I w- let's go back to to Lev. I love you. The not Lev. You're not married to Lev. You're married to Val. <laughs> Val. <laughs> There's a lot of three letter names I, in your family. I know. Lev, Max, and Val. Okay. Right. So you and Val married when you were pretty young. You were 20 when you got married. 19 when you got engaged. Um, do you ever find yourself because especially in this culture, it seems so countercultural to get married that young. Do you still to this day find yourself defending getting married at such a young age? Yes, I do, which is funny to me. But why is it funny to you? I think because it that actually used to be the norm. And because it's countercultural today, people find mm-hmm. it so surprising. And then they say... Like you're the exception. Most, if you you're get the married, anomaly, that kind of, they, that's what they say. Yeah, you're the anomaly. Yeah, exactly. And I don't think that's true. It might be in Hollywood, mm-hmm. <laughs> but I think all over the world and particularly in certain states within our country, it's very much normal. Mm-hmm. And I love that my kids also are looking for their spouse. They have the same mindset as we do in the sense of they're looking for their spouse now. They're Mm -hmm. not looking to just get all of their dating out of the way. People just look at the world very differently or relationships. And I don't think that one is necessarily right Mm -hmm. over another, but I don't think that getting married young is wrong. I don't think you have to find yourself before you get married. I don't think you have to be established in your ways at 35 before you should get married. Mm -hmm. I love that Val and I were young and we chose to grow together. I also recognize that that may not work for everyone, but it was certainly a choice for us. And through the tough times as well, When you're like, hey, I could take this path, he could take that path, we could choose not to enjoy certain things together. Like if he has hobbies that I just don't like, and I can just shut that part out of my life and not relate to him in any way, I could choose to do that. But even things that I think are boring, or he thinks are boring, we Mm -hmm. still choose to engage with one another to keep it going and Mm. grow together. Is that, do you think, the secret to the success of your marriage, that you've grown together? instead of grown apart? Absolutely. It's, like I said, very much a choice. And it's also being accountable to one another. As you know, you've been married a long time too. You mm-hmm. have to talk. been married 20 you years. To... Yeah. Yeah. We've yeah. been together since 1996. So I, John and I started, my husband and I started dating when I was 21. And we got married, I, we were 24. So we weren't, you know... We weren't that far, you know, behind you. So, yeah. And I agree. You know, when I moved to the East Coast, growing up in the Midwest, I think it was probably a little bit more normal than moving to the East Coast. People are like, how old were you when you got married? You ate, you married your college sweetheart. And it's definitely, you're treated in some aspects like a freak of nature, like you don't know yourself. Yes. But, but my point is, do you ever truly know? You're like, you're always growing. It's a journey. It's not exactly. just one destination. So why not pick somebody that you want to grow with and journey with? And yeah, there have been some really bad times. We were separated for a while. I'm just grateful that we stuck it out because we have three amazing kids. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's exactly how I feel. It's been ups, ups and downs, but we stuck it out and I'm so grateful and thankful that he's my partner for life. Yeah, you guys are super cute together. <laughs> you really Thanks. are. You posted what I thought was a really sweet picture, sweet and spicy, of you and Val on your 24th wedding anniversary. And it kind of like some people were a little offended by it. Were you surprised by the reaction? Yes and no. I was surprised that it went viral and became a topic of conversation on every social and news outlet. Mm -hmm. I thought that was ridiculous. It was so silly to me, but I wasn't surprised that there were some people that were offended just because I know who my, my core fan base is or followers. I always feel awkward saying that word, but like fans or followers, but I, I understand because I am a Christian and hold conservative values that that 
struck a nerve with people that they thought it was not appropriate to share. I understood, Mm -hmm. but I, (laughs) but I still celebrated it because you, and as as I said, if my husband's still happy to touch me after 24 years of marriage, I'll take it. When we would talk about intimacy on The View, you would get a little shy. You'd like to talk about it. It's a very important part of your marriage. Yes. Paula, I was, I, like, no one can embarrass Joy Behar, Uh but she was always like, (laughs) you know, she was like, why do you girls, you Christian girls, why do you love talking about sex so much? Well, well, because it makes a marriage good, Joy. It does. It really does. That was one of the things that we actually did like to talk about on The View. We worked (laughs) together in The View for a couple of years. Um, Speaking of controversy, that was a tough job. I, that was the toughest job I've ever had in my life and the toughest job I will ever have in my life. Me too. And I was so thankful you were there and just grateful for your heart and your your comfort in times of like, I can't do this anymore. You were mm-hmm. like a rock, Paula. I, I was always so nervous too when you weren't there because you really were, you were such a... Um, you were such a rock for me and I knew I could come to you and lean on you and you'd give me a pep talk or advice, even if I didn't know what I wanted to say or how I was going to say it. And you prayed with me, you loved on me. I felt like a little baby, like a little child and you mommed me in the best of ways, but you were like such a great friend to me on that show. And I'm forever grateful. I don't know that I could (laughs) have done it as long as I did without you there. You Mm. felt like my saving grace. What I appreciated about you, and this is the person that you've been, I think your entire life is you're, you live in an authentic space and you show up as your true self. Even if it's posting sweet and spicy photos on Instagram, like this is who you are unabashedly and you don't back down. You live with conviction. You live an original life, and that's an inspiration to me, whether or not people agree with you, right? Because there, you've got your critics. Everybody, we all have our critics. How do you live a life like that? Because that's an inspirational, aspirational life to just live in such conviction that you show up as your true self every day. You respect people. Um, you love people, and you let your light shine. How do you do that? You have a gift. Well, thank you. I appreciate all the kind words. I don't know how to be any other way. I really don't. I don't even know how to answer the question because I feel like as an actress, I should be able to cover up me better. (laughs) Mm -hmm. But I just, I can't. I'm an opinionated person, but I, I do have a huge heart and I love people. And I love God and I don't know how to be any other way than me when I show up anywhere. Well, it's admirable. I want to go back to the view, not to like open old wounds or anything, um, because I still have no wounds. Only uh, good times. Only good times. I still have a little PTSD um, (laughs) from the show. And I I will say it made me a better, stronger person. Uh, What I learned from that show is to see people as people and not see people as their politics. So to, to know whoever I'm sitting across from that I, we can have a respectful conversation and I can love you and respect you because you're fearfully and wonderfully made. It doesn't matter your politics. So that yes. was a gift. Amen. You and I, I think struggled for different reasons on the show. I struggled because you know, I felt like a failure because I was there to be a journalist and be neutral. And it was impossible to be neutral on the show, uh, especially when it came to politics. So I felt like a failure in that regard. I knew when it was time to go because I think you just do. I knew it was time to go because it was a mixture of burnout. It was a mixture of I didn't really love it anymore because it 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 became really challenging and it was uncomfortable. And I didn't have a piece in my spirit that I was supposed to do it anymore. Um, But for those that are in a job that's really difficult, they don't know if they should stay or they should go. Like, how did you know that it was time to walk away? And it's a prestigious job. I'm grateful for it. And I I know you are, you're grateful for the experience too. But how did you know that it was time to go? I'm going to answer that in one second because my dog is snoring so loudly. Um, Boris. And I'm afraid you're going to hear it. (laughs) I'm not even kidding. Hold on. Let me nudge him. 
Yeah. No, you can't. Okay. No, I can't hear Boris snoring. And okay, by the way, we're so... keeping that in the interview. <laughs> we're keeping that in. Boris, so the loud snoring dog. <laughs> it's the worst snore. Mm -hmm. So the question is, how did I know it was time to leave The View? Mm -hmm. When Donald Trump was elected president. Is that the truth? And it just became too political? It became yes. a different show. Yes, that is that is the honest truth, because I did leave shortly after that. I left in December mm -hmm. uh, after the election. I mean, that was a part of the reason. But the other full truth was that the schedule was so brutal for me. As you know, I mm -hmm. was not co-hosting every single day because I was flying back and forth every week to work on Fuller House and to work on the Hallmark movies that I was contractually obligated to do as well. I was on ABC doing The View, Netflix doing Fuller House, Hallmark doing Hallmark Channel original movies, and Hallmark Movies and Mysteries Channel doing my mystery series. Oh, that's right. It was brutal on my family. It was so taxing on me because of the politics. And, you know, we did the live show when the election on election night we did that episode that aired live on Lifetime. And I remember doing that episode and it was, it was one of the hardest nights of my life because everyone went in with great spirits thinking Hillary was going to win. And as the night went on, I just saw Joy like sweating it out and crying. I mean, just tearing, saying this isn't possible. This can't happen. And it was awful. And so <laughs> when we had to wake up and do the show the next day and announce that Donald Trump won, I just thought to myself, I can't do this anymore. I can't do this with my schedule. And I don't want to be the punching bag on this show for the rest of my time. And that was it. I mean, when we started the show, I was told that it was not going to be predominantly politics, but because it was an election year, that's what it turned into. And I just thought, just like you, my spirit is not shining. I am an unhappy person because I'm, I'm so tired and I feel like mentally and physically tired and I don't want to keep talking about politics mm -hmm. the rest of my time on the show. I love talking. I love talking about social issues. I love talking about parenting and life, but just politics, no thanks. Yeah. So that's when I just knew I, I can't do this because it's actually going to tear me apart as a, mm -hmm. the human being that I am. And it's not worth it. And it's not worth it for my family because I'd come home. I know this is long-winded, but I will never forget I, I came home and I was taping an episode of Fuller House. My parents came to the live taping every Friday night. Mm. And in between some of the scenes, my dad said, hey, honey, how's it going? I'm like, good, good. And he said, you, you just don't seem happy. Well, I can tell you're just not you. Every week we come and you just look tired and you just seem like everything's wrong. Mm. I was like, dad, I am juggling four jobs at the same time. You're right. I'm tired and I'm not happy. I can't do all of this. And something had to give. So yeah. that was like one of the moments. And after the election, I was like, done, I'm mm -hmm. done. <laughs> do you remember, I don't want to keep doing this. Do you remember that sense of relief you had when you finally were able to say goodbye to that chapter in your life? Oh, yes. It felt like a huge weight lifted off my shoulders. I, I will say you left with such grace and you have such a great reputation at the show still and you're beloved by the staff and the staff is so hardworking and um, mm -hmm. they really believe in the show. There's really incredible people that work at the show, even yes. though some may choose not to tune into the show. So I'm grateful because it, another thing that came out of it is our friendship. I don't Me ever either. have any regrets. I say everything happens for a reason. Me um, either. So, so I'm so grateful. I'll just finish it with that too, because mm -hmm. I, I grew so much from that show. I was, mm -hmm. I am so grateful for that opportunity as hard and as brutal as it was, but 
I don't think I would be as confident of a woman that I that I am now if it weren't for that show. Mm, it forced us to discover muscles that we didn't know we had. Exactly. I that's that's totally how I feel about it. Um, so so there you are juggling four jobs, but there was a long time in your life after you had your children, one, two, three, that you kind of disappeared intentionally. You're like, I need to yes. to take a hiatus. I want to focus on raising my kids. And I think when people think Candace Cameron Bure, they think, oh, you know, you know, full house, fuller house. Like she's got her hand in everything. She's so successful. Hallmark movies, this, that, and the other thing. But what they don't realize is you took a pretty extended hiatus from this burgeoning career after full house to raise your kids. Right? Yes. And that was intentional. Very intentional. And it actually... I still sit back when you when you list off those things, but it's all the stuff that you don't see. Everything looks like it's a Hallmark movie wrapped up in a package. Don't with ruin a it bow. for me. Don't ruin <laughs> it for everybody. Everything is a Hallmark movie with a happy ending, okay? But well, it's not. <laughs> it's come to that conclusion, but right. man, the process has been a lot to get there. So I did intentionally take off time to stay at home and raise my kids because I wanted to keep working when I was young, just coming off a of full house and I wanted to have a family as well. And I realized very quickly that I could not do both with the excellence that I wanted to do mm -hmm. both of them with. So one of them had to be put on pause and that was an easy choice. I wanted to stay home with my kids. I wanted to be the one that raised them. And with Val playing professional hockey, he only has a certain window to play professional hockey. I couldn't ask him to quit his job I mean, I could have, but I wasn't about to. I love that he was a hockey player. Are you kidding me? That was half the attraction. Yeah, I know Go that's hot, my, right? My husband, yes, <laughs> on the ice skating and playing those games. Okay. I loved it. Keep it G-rated, please, <laughs> for the audience. And yeah, you, so I took the time off. No, and it's 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 right now it's countercultural because so many women we kind of have to choose between family and career. And I remember you saying at The View, you're like, you can have it all, but you can't have it all at the same time. And that has always stuck with me. And I think we do try to have it all at the same time. But what you showed is that it can be done. You can off ramp and then you can on ramp again. And so Absolutely. often we're scared to take to if we want to dial it back or we want to try something new. We don't do it because of our fear. And we also buy that lie that there won't be anything waiting for us when we come back or that what we want to off ramp and do that we're not really contributing to society. Did you ever feel those pressures? Absolutely. I did feel those pressures, but more becoming from within myself. Mm -hmm. It's not because I really heard it from the outside. I mean, I felt like God had given me all these talents and gifts. So when I took time off to be a stay at home mom, I was no longer using those gifts. So that was a very difficult transition. So the pressure was coming from inside me and my heart. And I just thought like, I wasn't made to only cook and clean and change diapers. How did you find meaning in that season? Was that something that, was it just a paradigm shift for you that you had to realize what you were doing was valuable? Because society wasn't gonna tell you it was. The Bible shifted my whole perception and really digging into the word and understanding my purpose and the purpose as a mother to my children and my husband, it, God's word just changed mm. me. And that's when I really started digging into the Bible, because although I've considered myself to be a Christian since I was 12, I never really read the Bible. I would just go to church, church services. I never studied it myself. So when I had my children and then wanted to teach them about God, I realized I didn't really know God. Mm. So I started reading the Bible and it rocked my world. When I started reading God's truth about my life and people in general and what our purpose is. And then as a mother and wife, it changed everything for me. And I found that I, you know, we talk about pleasing an audience of one. I know you've heard that mm -hmm. phrase, expression, it's even a song, but that audience of one is God. And when I realized that I don't have to meet the expectations of people 
that I only need to meet the expectation with so much grace uh, of God, it just, that rocked my world. And then I found my, my security and my purpose and in being a stay at home mom and raising my children and trying to build my husband up to be the best man and husband he could be. Mm -hmm. You and your husband really have one another's back and you have, there's been an ebb and flow between his career and your career and they don't seem to be competing against one another. That's really tough to pull off. It is really difficult. And sometimes I'm surprised that we've been able to do it. I think we have so much respect for one another. And I say respect because yes, we love each other, but I really respect who he is and the talent that God gave him and the timing of that. And I want him to shine. And in the same way, recognize that I have more time within my job, within my profession than my husband does. And obviously he recognizes the same. And he recognizes in me that not only do I have more time to, to do my job, meaning you can be an actor until you're dead, mm -hmm. but he understands the passion that I have for my work. He has a very different kind of passion. I'm the kind of person that would do whatever I do for free because I love it. Mm. And he knows that if I'm not fulfilling my artistry in some way, my creativity in some way, then I am not the best person I can be. Right. So he recognizes it and encourages it and supports it because he knows that in turn makes me a better person when I'm at home. Yeah, and, and so we've taken the time to learn and grow and have the conversations. And some of them have been pretty ugly, you know, but if you will get to a point, we got to the point where it's like, okay, here's the rock bottom truth and honesty of it. And I can always work through whatever the circumstances, as long as there's honesty, as long as I know the truth, I'm like, great, I can deal with it. It has to be the truth. And that's part of the journey. As you said, you grow yeah. together. Growing sometimes involves pruning, right? Which yes. can be a little painful. Okay. So you just talked about the importance of exercising your creativity. And you have said about Fuller House, I know that, I mean, you have absolutely loved doing Fuller House. You said at the conclusion of the fifth season that you would do the show forever for the rest of your life. So for the Fuller House fans, can you give us any intel off the record? Are you guys pushing for it? It's completely out of our hands. It's between Warner Brothers and Netflix. So you have no sway. DJ Tanner have, can't say, no. we need to have a, a sixth season. I wish I could. Trust me, we tried. We okay. tried, but it's it's not about us. And at this point, it's not even about the fans because it's mm. our show's a little complicated in that sense because we're we are owned by Warner Brothers, the original show and the original characters. Ah, uh, okay. And Netflix owns the new characters. So it's a complicated modern family is what's happening here. <laughs> yes. Okay. There probably won't be another season, but who knows if there may be a whole new show. I always keep pushing for that. I, I was like, I want to do I want to <laughs> do the Golden Girls version in another 10 or 15 years. And yes. we'll name it Fullest House. Okay, put it out there right now. Put it mm -hmm. out there. Um, let's keep talking about your your creativity. Um You've been in nine Hallmark movies. Is that right? Nine Christmas oh, movies. Oh, sorry. You've been in nine. I've been in 26 Hallmark I, movies. I'm a terrible friend and a terrible <laughs> journalist. You've been in nine Christmas movies with the Hallmark Channel. Yes. If I only had Christmas as your ninth. By the way, my mother loves you. And um, if you really want to fulfill her wish, you'd find a way <laughs> to get me into a Hallmark movie, a Christmas movie, even if it's a cameo, even if I'm just photobombing. Um. Oh. Paula, I can make that happen. Are you shut up? I can make that happen. I don't even need a speaking part. Can you act? Yeah. I mean, my the reason I went into broadcasting, guys, this is going to be it. This is the moment. <laughs> this is my moment, okay? The reason I got into broadcasting was my drama teacher from high school. He would continually cast me as the narrator in almost all the productions. That's probably a bad indication of my acting skills because he 
cast me as the narrator, but he's the one that you said- You did just make me a little nervous saying no, that. Um, <laughs> no, 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 I, I can act. Um, but he cast me as the narrator because he said I had good inflection, I can tell a good story, and I was basically driving the show, which is what journalists do. We're telling the story, we're inflecting. Um, but I have, a, I have some acting chops. I was in a Bob Evans commercial. Have you heard of Bob Evans? I have heard of Bob. Okay. <laughs> My line was mashed or au gratin. I can send you that reel. I'd have to dig it up off VHS somewhere. Send um, it to me. Mm-hmm. I mean, really, how hard is it? Come on. Don't you get that all the time? <laughs> I'm kidding. I am Mala. kidding. No, I know you are. But I'm totally kidding. Yeah. It's it's can tough. We, can we just talk about this for a second? Because I'm sure you get it. Like, oh, how hard is it to talk into a microphone? Yeah. How hard is it to ask questions? And so I get that all the time. How hard is it to be in a Hallmark movie? Uh, how, <laughs> like, can I be in a it's Hallmark It's difficult. Movie? And I'm like, are you a professional actor? Mm-hmm. No, then no, you mm-hmm. cannot. <laughs> so is this you telling me no inadvertently? I thought you just opened the door. Well, here's the thing. If I'm you relying be, on your coaching. If you want to be a, you can be a background mm-hmm. person. They're called extras. I want to serve you coffee or something. Fill a scene. Yes. If you don't have a speaking part, I, well, that's easy. I can make that happen. Okay. If you have a speaking part, then we're going to have to make sure you can do the job. I don't want you to go put your neck on the line for me. And what happens if I bomb, then you're going to hate me forever. And I don't, no, I don't want I you won't. to lose credibility with Hallmark. I'll just cut you out. Paula, <laughs> that's what editing's for. Are you kidding me? Even, I can make it work. I'm leaving right now. <laughs> Listen, no, I, I, I would do the same thing. If you're terrible, I'd cut you out. So, okay. So let's just, let's ease into it. Let's do a non-speaking role. Okay. All right. We can do this. I can make this happen. Yeah. I, but I took enough like acting and drama courses, but I could, I could fake it. I'm sure you could. All right. Um, before we wrap it up, you have a new kid's book out, Candace's Playful Puppy, which is out right now. It's so cute. If I can say so myself. Is Boris the snoring German Rottweiler in the background? <laughs> is he featured in it or no? He is not. Okay. The little puppy is Freckles. Oh, so and- cute. I would, he's a mutt, but I would say he's more of like a little cocker spaniel or something Mm. like that. I chose not to have a Rottweiler as the new puppy because they grow into very big dogs that can be a little scary. A little intimidating. Yes. Boris is bigger than you. Yes, he is. Okay. Mm -hmm. He's much bigger than me. Oh. Tell us a little (laughs) bit about the book. So this is the third book in the children's series that I've written. It's the first one was Candace Center Stage and then Grow Candace Grow. And now this is Candace's Playful Puppy. And it's geared toward ages four to eight years old. And Candace is a little, she's probably eight years old. And she just goes on all kinds of adventures. She kind of marches to the beat of her own drum and she has lots of energy, not unlike myself. I was like inspired by (laughs) yourself. And she likes to get her hands in everything. And she is a leader at school and at her, in her neighborhood. And she always has all these great ideas, but they just aren't always good ones. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she tries to fix a lot of things, but she's not always helpful. In this book, Candace's Playful Puppy, she goes to the shelter and with her mom and they get to pick out a new puppy. And she vows to be the best doggy mom. There is that, you know, there will ever will be, Mm -hmm. but little freckles is a very rambunctious puppy and she needs to learn how to be faithful in training and teaching and being the dog mom that she set out to be, even though it's difficult. So in every book, there's a little lesson to be learned. And this one is all about faithfulness. Oh, well, you've been a faithful friend. (laughs) <laughs> and you've been a faithful too, wife Paula. and a faithful mother. And on that note, it's been such a pleasure to catch up with you. Will you come back on the podcast? Maybe you could be one of the regulars and we could just check in with you and continue to hound you about Fuller House season six. Okay? I would love that. Okay. I would absolutely love that. But I think and we really need to have you back to hold you accountable for the Hallmark movie that you're going to have I was just going to say, mm-hmm. I think if I want to be a regular 
on your podcast that mm -hmm. I get to drop by anytime I want. Anytime. I I need to actually secure your role in the next Hallmark movie yes. to make sure that I can still come back on your Is podcast. Is this legal? Is this quid pro quo right now? <laughs> I feel like it might be. It's just friends being friends. <laughs> These are just friends. <laughs> friends. All right, friend. Blessings to you. You too. I love okay. you, Paula. I love you. Give you a hug. But we're thousands of miles apart and it's COVID. Oh. So love yep. you, girl. Love you too. Hugs to the family. Mwah. Yours too. Okay, um, bye.